All right, we're recording. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started here, and we'll however we have a few people additionally filter in here. But anyway, uh, welcome everybody to the latest uh, monthly virtual edition of the monthly EFF Austin meetup. My name is Kevin Welch. I'm the current president of the board at EFF Austin. We also have one of our board members, uh, David Hensley, here with us. Um, and yeah, for those of you who are first timers and like who is EFF Austin, well, as you might gather from the name, we have something to do with Austin, uh, Texas. Um, we are a long-standing Austin-based digital civil liberties organization. Um, we work closely with uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation based in San Francisco. If you've never heard of them, you can sort of think of them as the ACLU for the internet. Um, they fight to preserve your rights, especially your First and Fourth Amendment rights in emerging technological and digital spaces. They fight for things like net neutrality and, and encryption, protecting Section 230 of the CDA, and just a lot of other good stuff to try to make a you know, online life, a better place where you can more freely express yourself and have your rights protected. So they're very cool people. You should, um, you know, you should uh, donate to them if you're so inclined or us if you're so inclined, but they do a lot of really good work. Um, we, they've been around about 30 years, as have we. We are the oldest member of what is called the EFA or the Electronic Frontier Alliance, which is a group of affiliate uh distributed uh, activist orgs all around the United States who uh, share similar ideological beliefs with EFF. Um, as I said, we are the uh, the oldest standing one by a decent margin uh, because our founding was kind of tied up in EFF themselves founding. But um, but yeah, there's over about a hundred EFA groups scattered around the United States at this point, um, probably one near you. So if you're not in Austin and dialing in, um, look around, there's probably one near you that uh, you can get involved in if these are issues that matter to you. Or you can even start one yourself. Um, for instance, uh, in the chat here tonight, we have a former EFF Austin uh, member who now lives up in Buffalo named George Hampton, who is working on trying to get an EFA chapter going in Buffalo. And in fact, if anybody from Buffalo is here tonight, he says that you are welcome to email him at info at besecureonline.org if you are wanting to uh, collaborate with him further on this. I will share that email to everyone in the chat here. Oh, and George has permission, so he shared it, very good. Okay, so that little preamble out of the way. Um, so anyway, yeah, and as far as what we do, um, we're primarily an education organization. The main thing we have going on on a routine continuing basis is that we um, we have monthly meetups. They traditionally have been in person at Capital Factory in downtown Austin. Um, obviously, COVID changed a lot of that, and they have been virtual since then. They're traditionally on the second Tuesday of every month at 7 p.m. Um, starting in the new year, we are going to start experimenting with transitioning back to in-person meetups as um, local health and safety conditions warrant or not. But we are going to try to have our January meetup be in person, but we're also going to be exploring um, ways that we can still allow people who attend remotely either because they don't like to go downtown to Capital Factory and it's more convenient to attend from home or they're not from Austin or sometimes even our speakers aren't from Austin. We're gonna explore ways to continue to use our Zoom room to try to provide a merged experience as well as for those who um, um, the, the, their risk profile of attending an in-person event, it does not make sense. We want to remain accessible. So um, look for more of that in the coming year. In fact, I believe the uh, gentleman who's gonna be giving our January talk, Michael Furstenfeld is here, if he is at all interested in giving a like 30 second spiel of what he's gonna be talking about. It's fine if uh, not. Um, Mike, do you wanna tell what you're gonna talk about or should I? Or he may not be there right now. Ah, okay. Well, I know Mike does a lot of very cool stuff, and he's going to probably be talking about some of his cool uh, digital art projects he does. Um, <laughs> Mike says he's not hooked up to the mic at the moment. I'll let him, he usually, he'll probably segue into our after party at the end of this, so I'll let him give a little spiel about what he's going to talk about next month at that time. Um, but yeah, if you or somebody you know would be interested in speaking to our meetups, we have several people who are going to be talking in the coming year, but we're always looking for speakers. If they're doing interesting things in, in law, technology, and, and the ways these intersect, or just cool new ways to use technology and creating new societies, new art, whatever, we're always looking to profile that stuff. Um, yeah, 
And um, we also do other things. We've been known to do uh, pretty cool cyberpunk parties, though those have been on hiatus as well because of COVID. We also do a little bit of uh, legislative advocacy work at the city and state level. Um, we just recently helped assist a UT Austin professor with a uh, focus group on attitudes toward uh, public network cameras and privacy attitudes toward those. We also were involved in a coalition here in Austin to, that successfully defeated the recent Prop A that would have uh, massively increased police funding. We uh, came at it from a digital civil liberties perspective and a lot of the uh, surveillance issues around modern policing. So we do a lot of stuff. Um, and we hope to, hopefully in the new year, as uh, things start getting more normal, we hope to start doing more things. So I've rambled on here for quite a little bit. So I'm going to quickly ask if there are any uh, further announcements anybody from the community would like to make. Uh, shameless self-promotion is totally allowed. Some of you may not be able to unmute yourself, but you're welcome to uh, send a chat at me if you would like me to share anything with the community. As long as it's relevant to digital civil liberties, it can literally be your own little thing, I don't care. This was always easier to do when we were meeting in person, but I do try to replicate it here. But if nobody does have anything they'd like to share, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker and I will let her take it away for what you're all actually here for. All right, um, so to introduce our speaker. Our speaker this month is uh, Ann Boyson. Um, Ann has spoken at EFF Austin, I think at least twice before. So she's joined our rare club of three times speakers. <laughs> Ann uh, is a data analyst and futurist with an interest in studying the first generation to experience their childhood and early adult years in the 21st century. For the past two decades, Anne has helped stakeholders in both for-profit and not-for-profit organizations adapt to the new needs that are likely to emerge at the younger generation's next life stage. Anne enjoys dissecting the data to look for surprising patterns and weave these insights into compelling stories. Anne has a master's degree in strategic foresight from the University of Houston and a graduate certificate in business analytics from Penn State University. And now to... Uh, tee her up for what she's going to talk to us about, as you might have gathered from the title, we're going to be talking about there's been a lot of reporting in the news about the so-called um, mental health crisis that Gen Z is experiencing with the culprit often being named as social media. In fact, when uh, the whole Finsta debacle with the Facebook hearings happened with Senator Blumenthal, for those of you who don't know, Finsta stands for fake Instagram, which is just teens like Instagram accounts for their parents, but Senator Blumenthal thought it was a product Facebook was selling. But um, but that actually, that whole incident was what, uh, and, and made a, a comment I thought was very intelligent and sort of sparked this whole, when you give this talk, where, you know, the whole narrative was that like, you know, that the reason Gen Z is having a mental health crisis is social media. And I mean, it's true, there is a mental health crisis. Only 45% of Gen Z reports good mental health and researchers are scratching for answers. The common choice of a scapegoat has been social media, just like earlier technologies like the telegraph or cable television. Um, and so we're increasingly hearing as disillusionment and negative sentiment builds up about how universities, professors, and we're hearing how university professors and whistleblowers are offering social media as the villain of the moment, or, you know, it used to be smartphones, but social media has supplaced that. But Anne is going to argue a thesis that while the mental health crisis is absolutely real, and maybe social media or smartphones do have some part to play in it, that maybe this prevailing narrative is not really what's going on with Gen Z. So um, I'm, with that, I'm going to let Anne take it away. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for introducing me and for introducing my talk, because that's uh, that was right on point when I'm going to talk about Generation Z and the mental health crisis. My, my biggest motiv motivation for doing this is that you've heard this you know, this, this common quote that it's not what you don't know that is going to harm you. It's what you think, you know, that just ain't so. So the danger here is that, like you said, there, social media might have some impact here. But if we if we are going to blame a huge issue like this, where that literally might cause some of our kids to literally lose their lives, should we just grasp for easy answers? Or should we just it does it need a little bit more digging? And that's so that's right. That's my motivation for going here. And so it is becoming a fairly pervasive uh, narrative because if you look at uh, if you do a generic search on Generation Z and mental health, 
then you will get some amplifiers, you know, like more depressed, which is kind of synonymous um, in the UK, awareness issues. But then there's one, there's one search uh, query here, which is like basically a suggestion you get because this is what other people are searching for. And that is generation mental health social media. Uh, generation Z mental health social media. So that kind of like indicates that there's a hypothesis here that there's some sort of connection between these two things. And that's why I think it's extremely important that we, we dig into this a little bit deeper. So I want to start with, um, I, first, first I wanna start with some disclaimers. I think this is important. I am not a professional in mental health. I do not have letters after my name. So please don't think that I'm here to give anybody mental health advice. If, if that is an issue, don't, don't base this, you know, your solution to your problem on my presentation. Use it as a piece, you know, another data point, but you should definitely talk to, to professionals about this. Um, another thing I also want to say is that I do work in tech. I want to be extremely clear that I am presenting myself here. I'm not presenting any company that I'm currently working for or, or have worked for in the past. So what I'm, you know, if, if you had, if you have beef with any of, uh, any of the things that I'm saying, come to me, you know? So um, anyway, so these are, this is entirely driven by my own curiosity. I'm not like benefiting or, you know, any, in any way. But I think that um, I, for me, this problematic is rooted in generational, like generational research and the curiosity I have around that. And um, I started researching Generation Z about like some 20 years ago. I want to say like maybe, yeah, no, less than that. I, maybe I started 18 years ago in the last three years. I haven't, it's been more like a, like a side thing for me. Um, but I want to base this on what generational theory is and what it's not. So the study of generation is very much an academic orphan. So this, it's kind of like this, um, this, this orphan, this kid that gets invited to play dates. And they're, they're very popular and as guests in the house and because they're, they're very entertaining and it's like they join an audience. But nobody wants to claim parental responsibility for it. And what happens then is that you don't have epistemological guidelines. What happens then is that you get this vacuum that attracts all sorts of people who want to have some sort of opinion on generations. Uh, because you don't have those the, those those boundaries and those sort of like guidelines of what determines good research and what is not, right? So so, and nonetheless, it, it's it's still very popular among both both you know the more or less you know academic academically grounded researchers. Um, so it straddles the field of sociology, of history, of um, psychology, and, and and digital anthropology as of late. So, 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 so there's, you know, it's being accused very often of being a crackpot theory, like generational theory is a crackpot theory. You hear that, hear that quite a lot. You hear that it's a pseudoscience. Now that is actually not true because in order to be a pseudoscience, it has to be, um, it, it can't be scientifically debunkable, so to speak. Like it's, it, it has, you can't test it. You can't test the theory. And there's, there, you can absolutely test these theories. And it's a very, it's cohort studies. It's basically the study of with if you group people into age group as when they were born and the in-group variation is smaller than the between group variations. So you look at you know people of a certain age, group them together, and you find less variation there uh, than, than you have between groups. And you see that pattern consistently over time so that there seems to be something specific to that generation based on when they were born, not, not like a life stage or anything like that, then you have indeed found a generational um, um, difference. Now, here's the thing, is that first of all, it's very difficult to get all that data. So I'm, I'm actually going to sort of violate my own principles in a little bit because you just don't have enough data. Um, but it, there's some, um, um, uh, uh, I've lost my, lost my train of thought, but that, that there's also that you, 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 
you you're going to be debunking more myths. You're going to be debunking. You're going to be more busy debunking headlines. So you're, you're going to be more busy taking down theories than actually be building up, uh, you know, theories. Because when you actually do the rigorous research, you're not going to find a lot of, 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 of support for a lot of generational theories. So why am I so big on, on, on explaining that is because this, this very fact that mental health, that that is a very clear generational trait, it's ever so more profound because of that. Because it's not in the same category as like, you know, oh, um, you know, this is how Gen Zers are in the workplace. And this is kind of like, these are their little, I don't know, you, you see them, you see the clickbait, right? So this is actually true. This is based on very, very rigorous science. You can actually see it in the, in the in indexes. You can see uh, the different graphs that uh, the cohort that has increased within mental health problems over time is the 16 to 19 year old and the 20 to 21 year old and 22 to 25 year old. So you see that the people who experienced their formative years in the 2010s, they are the ones that have had the highest increase. And this is particularly uh, the case for adolescent girls. So there, there, there is, uh, I think this is like what's one constant is that, uh, that adolescent girls um, tend to, you know, they, for example, they tend to attempt more suicide and boys succeed in more suicide. Now we actually see that young, young girls are actually, you know, succeeding in, in that as well. So this is a problem. It, it clearly is. Um, and uh, uh, what we also said, like like Ke uh, Kevin mentioned, that only forty five percent are uh, of that generation is uh, agreeing that they have um, uh, good mental uh, health. Um, and uh, but but they're also the most likely to actually seek help for it. So so one common argument is that well, it's just that you know the the, the stigma around uh, mental health problems have disappeared. So now people are more likely to admit that they have mental health issues. And that is partly true, but it's not the entire truth. So you see both. So you both see that there is an increase and there's also uh, that the, the, the stigma has fallen away. So <clears throat> Now, now let's get to the social media connection and the theory that is being made. It mostly is based on uh, a book written by uh, Professor Jean Twenge at um, uh, uh, San Diego State University. And it was written back in God, a few years ago, uh, maybe in like, I think it was around 2017, 18. That's when this awareness started to come out. So this is like, when we really started to talk about uh, about this possible connection. Now, I also wanted to bring up uh, another professor, uh, another actually social psychologist, uh, Jonathan Haidt, who has also been doing a lot of research on sort of like what makes people different. And um, he's a fascinating researcher, but he kind of finds uh, peculiarities that have to do with like either your political affiliation and also generations. So, um, so his, so so both of these two are. First of all, the reason that I want to pick them is because I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna try to spend a, a, an hour of your time to debunk, um, you know, uh, quack quack makers or you know like these these pseudoscientists. I'm gonna actually pick on the big guys, and I really have a lot of respect for these two. They're they're great researchers. They really are. Um, and Twenge has done a lot of research on millennials as well. And this, the reason that I like her research is because she's very consistent. She's very scientific. So she, she, she has a lot of data behind her. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so, but, but I'm also going to pick on it. So I'm also gonna take it apart. I'm just, just trying to tell you that I, it's, I don't have an issue with these people. I don't have an issue with these academians. It's the, it's the conclusions that they make that I'm going to try to make an argument against. Um, so um, Jonathan Haidt is kind of like um, riffs a little bit on, on her. Like, yeah, it, people, kids are spending too much time on screens and on social media. And, and, and he's also talking about helicopter parenting that young people today are, are have um, mental health issues because they're being sort of coddled and overprotected. And then they come to 
uh, university campuses, and um, they're they're kind of bringing in this this cancel culture at at university camps, uh, um, campuses because they're not used to interacting with people who have different opinions, and that that eventually also has a negative mental health effect. The reason I bring up both of these two is that they're both now kind of doing this this research on Generation Z and social media and allegedly finding connections there. I want you to notice one thing here, that both of them, both of their hypotheses, both of the theories that they're making are individualizing the problem. So in both cases, whether you want to play, blame it on social media or screen time on the one hand, or on parenting or on sort of like this, this inability to, to handle conflict and, and um, it's, it's very, it's sort of an individualized explanation that you, they're not kind of looking for structural changes in the environment, that that could, might have an impact. And that's okay, but there are psychologists, I think it's very common to look for that, that you look for the source of the problem in yourself. Um, but I'm, 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 I want you to just keep that because I'm about to make an argument later. So just keep, keep note of that. Um, my biggest issue with, uh, with, with Twenge's research for all of the data that she has, I do have some, some, some criticism, is that almost the entire hypothesis, or almost the enti entire theory is based on curve fitting. It's basically based on this presumption that correlation somehow implies uh, uh, causa causality. And <clears throat> if you remember your SAT classes, you might have heard this example of um, ice cream and the drowning accidents where like when, when uh, ice cream sales increase, so do drowning accidents. And then if you wanted to see some causality there, you might say that, oh, don't eat ice cream because you can drown. But obviously it's because both happen in the summer. So that, that's the problem. Another thing I think is kind of interesting is that um, Khan Academy actually uses this idea that um, social media causes a mental health problem. He's actually using that as an example of this, of this problem of correlation, uh, not necessarily um, you know, implying causality. So, so that's the biggest problem. Um, but there's other things about it too, is that when they when she's establishing a correlation in, in some of these um, in some of these associations, so some of these positive associations, they're actually pretty weak. So there are researchers who have been testing some of that, um, some of the correlation and found that you know the, the social media use and depressive systems, uh, dep depressive symptoms. Is uh, it has like a Pearson's arc correlation of 0 0.06 in girls and 0 0.01 in boys, which is it can be statistically significant, but it's pretty neg negligible. So um, if that's the case, then you know there is a huge difference. Like there, there's the, there's a lot of other causal factors here that that really really you know uh, we really need to look into. Now, granted, there's been other studies too that have found. Um, I, I can't, I'm not going to spend a lot of time to debunk or like not debunk, but go through every single studies. And there are probably a lot of studies that, that are, are, are strong and, and show a strong um, correlation. I just wanted to kind of point to this because this, because this was kind of like the founding uh, foundation of this theory. So one of the ways that we could test it, for example, is um, we, we should be able to assume that if social media has such a negative effect or screen time, if that has such a negative effect on young people, then we should probably be able to say that we're, well, in countries where they spend a lot of time on social media, then they should have correspondingly larger problems with mental health. And then if you actually, so, so here you can see that in Philippines, there you spend more time on so, social media than, than, um, than Mexico, which spends more time than China. And then the USA is kind of like down there. And then Japan is uh, the country that spends the least. Now, this is, this is not a generational, uh, this is not generational data, but I'm just using this for, for comparison. Now, if we look at um, the age standardized depressive disorders in percent of population, and we look at that over time in those very same countries, we don't see that trend. We don't see that just because, you know, the Philippines, people in the Philippines are using social media more, 
they, they're not having any, you know, um, uh, more negative trend uh, on, that, on that dimension. So I've tried to color code it here that if they're if countries with high social media use, I put them in more sort of uh, warmer hues and then the low social media use in more cooler colors on the bottom here. So you should expect to see something, to see that reflected in the data, right? You don't really do that. What you see is that the United States has in general had very high problems with depressive disorders in general. That's, that seems to be like a trait with the United States. So there obviously must be some other variables at play here. And of course there are. And it like, again, you know, you could say, yeah, but you, you, need, to, you need to check for so many other variables because there's so many things that can impact whether people have a lot of mental health issues. And that's, that's precisely my point. It's like, it's too simple to just take two trends and put them together. So there was a study by um, Brooke University where they monitored the same Gen Zers over time. So they had two groups, like one that were younger, like they were still teenagers. And then they had some that were like early college uh, kids. And they monitored them over time, over six years. And what they found was that first of all, there wasn't much correlation there at all. And when they did find a correlation, it was that depression, depression came before social media use. So there, there's an indication here that social media usage or uh, you know a lot of good social media usage is more like a, a symptom of something else so like when when they present together it's because people are already depressed and they seek social media to um, to kind of help them out and to feel better right so um yeah so if anything it's like it's reversed that if there's a causality it's, it goes in the opposite way so could we expect that the moral panic is, is dying down? There was another study very recently that found that screen time didn't have much of an effect either on, um, on young people. Um, so, so again, you know, you're starting to see people kind of take issues with this, this very sort of black white thinking on social media and social media being like the big, the big bad wolf in this, um, um, in this whole um, problematique. Um, <clears throat> I want to pick on the, um, uh, you mentioned the, the debacle with the, with the whistleblowers and, um, with uh, Facebook a, a few months back. And if you look at the hyperbolic um, headlines, all you see is that Instagram is toxic for girls. That's, that's almost all you will see. If you, search, if you search for Google now, that's all you see. Like Instagram is toxic for girls. But when you actually look at the statistics, what you'll find is that there's only one of these bars that shows that um, that, that that it's really problematic for young girls, uh, where, where you have more young girls saying that it's a negative thing than than um than than a positive thing. So that you see the blue bar here, and that is the body image. So you see that there's there's more. Um, now, if, when you see almost all of these other uh, bars here, you'll see that there are more people, there are more young people, both boys and girls, who think that social media or Instagram is, is positive for them, make, make, made them feel better. And even down here, where, uh, when, when, you know, which really refutes um, the, uh, the allegation that it increases loneliness, anxiety, and sadness, because there are, more, there are far more people, both bo boys and girls, who say that, that it makes them feel less anxious and sad. This is also very consistent with um, with the APA survey, uh, American Association, uh, American Psychological Association uh, has tried to study stress in America a few years ago, where they asked a number of questions, and what they found was um, that uh, Generation Zers, there were more Gen Zers who um, who felt you know, that social media was um, valuable for them, that they felt a sense of support more than those who felt like they were judged. So again, I'm not saying that it's a, that it's not problematic, that you have a high minority of, of, of kids that feel judged and feel like they're, they're going to deal with body dysmorphia because of it. But I'm also, it's, it's important to keep this uh, to keep a balanced view on this and, and understand that that there's a there's not an all or nothing thing here. 
I also think it's important to remember. So I'm, I'm from Generation X. And um, I remember back in my days, uh, the, the big bad wolf was, uh, was MTV. And uh, when it comes to this issue of body dysmorphia, I remember very clearly that um, this was the, the beginning of the mu music videos where you, we sat there and we consumed the music videos. And in every single music video, it seemed like that they had hired some, some uh, supermodel to, 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 to be, you know. And then you will see the same faces in the, in the glossy magazine, et cetera. So it's, it's not like, it's not like this distorted represent, representation of what a young girl is supposed to look like. It's not, it's not like this is new, right? I mean, you can go back to, to the, you know, uh, to the, you know, when back when we were wearing corsets and we, they, we, women would swallow tapeworms and have their rib cages cut off, you know, to, in order to fit into this little narrow corsets back in the 1700s. So you can't really blame a technology for these age old, you know, issues that, 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 that uh, women have dealt with for, for a very long time. And I think that's very simplistic to, to do that. Um, there's another anecdote that I wanted to bring up. And uh, this has to do with this uh, quote unquote connection with between suicidality and social media. So I remember I was holding a presentation about something similar a few years ago. And after my presentation during the Q&A session, there was a woman who stood up and she said that um, she had also been worried because of after this book, she also was very worried about um, the social media use of her children and the screen time, screen time use of her children. So she um, implemented a screen time rule at home where during it, like after a certain time during the day, all the kids, everybody in the family were to drop their phones into a, into a, um, a basket and not claim it until the next day. Just so, you know, you can wind down the day without, without screens. It seems like a very reasonable thing to do. And I, I agree. I, I don't think that there's anything wrong in that. It's just that about one week or so into this new experiment, what happened is that her daughter had been attempted contacted by someone that she knows. It wasn't a very close friend, but it was someone who felt like a need to talk to her daughter. And when he wasn't able to reach her, he had attempted to end his own life. So it's, it's quite ironic that that very technology that was supposedly increasing our risk of suicide in, in our children was now the communication device that could actually prevent that. So, so these, this is kind of like a you know, baby bathwater situation. Like we have to be really, really careful when we look at this, these things and really examine the data as well. And you know, one of the things that I liked about the Facebook study and also the American uh, Psychology Association study is that they actually talk to the kids. It's not like just you know, taking some data sets and looking at, okay, what's the rate of suicide, what is the rate of hospital admission because of um, you know, major depression, depressive episode. It's not that, they actually ask the kids themselves, like, you know, what do you feel? How do you feel like social media feels for you? And, uh, and in order to address that, I, I just wanted to take you on a little time travel because uh, my major biggest problem when I first started out uh, as a generational consultant on my own back in like, I think it was around 2011, was that the kids were still a little bit too young to answer surveys. So I, I couldn't really get all of the psychographic data that I really wanted to have. And then uh, someone with much smarter than me and with much more bandwidth than I have, her name is uh, Norena Hertz. And she's, uh, I forget which, I think is it the LSE or one of, uh, one of the universities in Britain. She had done a quite an extensive survey on, on Generation Z, on like I think 2000 or something, and um, 2000 respondents. And I, what really struck me was that here was the first time that I really noticed a huge shift from millennials, because before then, all the focus had been on millennials and their sort of like their persona. And their persona was that millennials were very kind of happy-go-lucky they were very optimistic they had been receiving you know uh, uh you know prices just to to you know trophies just to show up to the competitions etc without necessarily winning or anything so 
again, very much that old riff that you hear from, uh, you know, about helicopter parenting and, and uh, Jonathan Haidt, what he's talking about. And, and here, all of a sudden, she found something completely different. So she found that this generation, Generation Z, was a lot more sober in their perception of the world around them and the, the problems of the world around them. They didn't have, they didn't share this optimism that, that millennials had. And I found it quite interesting. Um, and so she called them Generation K for Katniss. So this is, this is all of these headlines are taken from, you know, back like 2015, I think. And where, where, where she really asked them like, why, why, are you, why are you guys sad? Like, what, what are you guys upset about? And then, you know, again, it's, it's very much like they can't rely on the gr grownups. Pretty much what we've we've heard for, for the past few years that you know when when uh, young people are protesting the environment, for example, that you know that grownups aren't doing enough, and so so they really associate themselves with this sort of Hunger Games, um, you know, um, topic or or theme. Uh, I I was selective here too because I'm I quoting myself as well because I was also interviewed around like this time. I think this was maybe a few years before where. I also mentioned to uh, uh, a, a journalist at BBC uh, Capital where I mentioned that, yeah, if you have school shooting uh, shootings around you, and this was very soon after the, um, the massacre at the youth camp in Norway. And since I'm from Norway and I was actually very close to where this happened, um, it was very easy for me to kind of draw that connection and, and see that, you know, I, I, I saw what kind of impact it had on my own children. And it, for me, it was very obvious that this generation is going to, have to deal with some other issues uh, than generations before. But then it kind of got forgotten because all of a sudden with social media was a big issue. So let's look at these main causes of stress in Generation Z. So <clears throat> this again is back to the American Psychological Association survey of, of 2019, that's when they did it. And so you can see that more than adults, they are worried about, they're very stressed out about mass shootings uh, they are worried about the rise in suicide rates, and it's kind of like festers on them. Uh, they're really worried about climate change and global warming. They are um, worried about uh, separation and deportation, deportation of immigrant families. And they're worried about widespread sexual, sexual harassment and assault groups. So again, if you ask kids themselves, what is it that makes you anxious? What is it that causes you stress in your daily life? Well, it's right there. So you might say, yeah, but have we seen an increase? Has there really been like a shift though? Has, do we really see a reason for them, for this generation to more, be more worried about these things than, uh, than, than older generations? Because remember, Jean Twenge had this, these wonderful graphs, right? Well, let's take a look at it. Well, school shootings, have allegedly, you know, increased as well. Now there's been like, uh, I, I know that a lot of the social media researchers are really concerned about what happened around 2012 because that's when Facebook came with their like button. And that's when a lot of these trends started to shoot up. But look at this, just look, look at what happens in 2012. That is an alternative explanation for, the, for all of these anxiety and worries. Well, this is Sandy Hook. This is these kids at Sandy Hook, that's kind of the, the, the younger siblings of this generation that we're measuring right now. Wouldn't it be plausible to think that when, when kids learn about these things that that has an effect on their mental health? I would think so. Look at this, cost of college, who would have guessed, right? I mean, it's been an exponential growth in the cost of getting an education. And this education, this, this generation, this must be the first generation that has been inundated with this idea that if you don't go to college, you're going to be sitting under, under a bridge with a styrofoam cup uh, for the rest of your life because you, you're not going to be able to get a job. That's basically what they've been taught. So if they can't afford to go to college, then life is over pretty much. And now we actually see declining college rates because they say that it's too expensive. So young people are coming out and they're saying, I'm not going to college because it's too expensive. Okay, so that's one of the reasons. What else? Um, like I mentioned, you know, for uh, other uh, stats that, you know, they're, they're worried about the future, 75% are 
actually frightened about the future. It's very difficult to have perfect mental health if you're worried about the future. 45% um, think that the humanity is doomed. Now, if that's what you think might happen, then I don't see how anybody can, ha can have good mental health given those, those statistics. Um, and you can see here too, again, you have like a, a trend that goes up, you know, with uh, um, uh, the, um, the, the number of people who are either worried or somewhat worried um, about um, global warming that has increased as well quite a bit. So you see the same curve. So again, you know, you could cherry pick and say, oh, look at social media, look how that increased during that same time that they got depressed. Well, here's some other curves. So to summarize, you know, uh, there's been a lot of attention given to social media as a cause of uh, mental health issues in Generation Z. And most of these are correlational and bivariate, meaning that they're not looking at a lot of different explanatory variables and testing that to see like which ones might have the most power. Um, a few of these studies show strong, significant effects. And the longitudinal studies actually find the opposite causation, so that the, the depression is, cause, is, is, is leading to social media use. Um, Generation Z give other answers, uh, which are about systemic causes. Again, it's not, you can't individualize this. It's not necessarily with the family itself, but there are structural things that are happening in their environment outside of them, outside of their control that are, are, are sort of causing this sort of despondence and fear. Um, and, uh, and many of these worries, they correlate with men mental health problems as well. So I just wanted to sort of, um, you know, it, it was mentioned again that, you know, every new technology, and I think you can quote me on this, that each time there's a new technology that experiences some mass adoption in the youngest generation, you can be pretty sure that the older generation is going to find a way to demonize it. And they're going to find a way to to sort of claim that the younger generation is doomed because of it. Um, I, uh, I think it was Carl, I don't know if Carl is here today, but uh, he shared a, a great article yesterday, which about something about like um, when, the, when bicycles came out, then there was like a, a backlash against bicycles because they would liberate women. <laughs> so, you know, every new technology is going to have, have some repercussions. So. So again, you know, it's um, I'm not again. I'm not trying to take down Twangy or Heights or any of those other uh, the 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 good academians that are doing strong research. But I think it's worthwhile picking on a little bit and, and see what else we can come up with. Um, and, and again, like the charlatans, I'm not even going to go there. But um, there's a lot of charlatan theories as well. But we don't need to waste our time on that. So um, yeah, that was what I have. And I'm, I'm really excited to a conversation. I would love to hear what you guys think. And um, yeah, thank well, you. Well, thank you for a very uh, interesting uh, talk with a uh, persuasive thesis uh, and I quite enjoyed it. Um, yeah, and so I say a number of you, because I know you personally will, will just be able to probably unmute yourselves, but the way we can just do this in general for both those who can and can't, is uh, if you have a question for Anne, you can either type it in the chat or you can raise your hand and I can unmute you or you can unmute yourself if you have the privileges, but uh, if I call on you. But um, I'm gonna tee us off and, and I have a question for Anne. So, you know, it. I'm going to avoid the easy uh, trap of just like saying, oh, okay, well, everyone's just, who's claiming this social media narrative is, is purely, not acting in good faith and just looking for a scapegoat, basically. Um, but I guess, I guess the first question is for those like the researchers you cite, why do you think they are so strongly persuaded that it is social media? And a, a sort of follow-up question for the people who maybe are not acting in good faith. I know, I know it's uh, you know, the the easy answer would be well, maybe it's that they're not acting in good faith just because they don't want to acknowledge all these ways older generations have screwed up the world that Gen Z is rightfully upset about. But is a possible other theory for the people not in good faith that they want to ban social media for other reasons and are using the kids as the reason why we must ban it? Yes. 
actually the more nefarious theory there um and again i share i share your sentiment that like that's not the probably the dominating dominant reason for why we have all of this, this attention around social media but i do think that it's very convenient if you're going to sort of stifle the very same channels that young people are using to voice their displeasure with the older generation, right? I mean, it's, very, it's a very effective way. Let's just take the weapons away from them. And let's say, oh, you, you're worried about a waistline over there. Oh, no, okay, let's take that away from you. When that is in fact, that's what they have. They, they've been sort of uh, dispowered or like, a, you know, disarmed that this whole generation they don't it's not like they have a big political voice it's not like they have a lot of um strong economic power look at most people in in congress are over how many how old are they 80 or something you know so so it's not like they are represented well so if you take away this you take away an extremely powerful media because they actually have a lot of power this younger generation has tons of power they have influ influence like they have digital influence and they know how to use it so that can actually be a threat that might be a threat to some people in power so there might definitely be some incentives to to try to to sort of just to to um to really build riff on that narrative that oh this is bad for you and and i guess also as and i want to make sure we cover this as well um for the for the researchers who you respect and are acting in good faith, why do you think they're so persuaded of their thesis when you've raised compelling evidence that their thesis might be pure correlation and not causation? Yeah, I I'm actually very, very surprised myself, to be honest. Uh, I, I I would if you had to speculate, why would you say? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, so one thing I know is that before this iGen um, study, this uh, Generation Z and social media and uh, depression type of study mm -hmm. that uh, Twingy has uh, preoccupied herself with for the past few years, before then, she was actually very pretty well known for launching the, the theory that um, millennials, uh, that there's a growing narcissism among the millennial generation. Hey, I um, resemble that. <laughs> <laughs> you know it's interesting because she's she has a lot of good data and it's just that yeah it kind of peaked with millennials but it had you know narcissism trend started with boomers and it's kind of increased and increased and increased and what i found extremely interesting was that she had written a paper with um when she first started looking at before this whole social media thing, when she first started looking at Generation Z, because I was like, when is Trangi going to start looking at Generation Z? Because I was, again, I'm, I, you know, I admire a lot of her research and her rigor. And so I was like, when is she going to do that? And then she wrote a paper with some other researchers. I forget their names, sorry. But what I found interesting was that the narcissism trend had had turned gone down. And and that I think that's when she started speculating, huh? What is it? So, so, so like, okay, first they built themselves up, the kids built themselves up and then they kind of like put themselves down because, and then I think maybe she was convinced that, oh, it's because of social media. And as soon as social media comes, then people start compare, comparing themselves with each other. So, so it's like, okay, you can't be narcissistic anymore or you can't be like, well, I, I, I actually say that, you know, you, you might actually become more narcissistic when you're insecure, but for some reason, I guess in, in her, I'm just trying to parlay her research, but for some reason now the focus wasn't so much on narcissism, but the focus was more on how you perceive yourself in light of that comparison that you do with other people when you have social media. So I feel like there's a duality here that there, I feel like that one focus area kind of gave birth to the next one. So it's like you, she might kind of see Generation Z a little bit in the context of, of millennials. So I wonder if that might be one of the reasons that she's doing this. And I think also, like, if you have first started, you know, making an argument, you need to kind of follow up on it. But I do, I do find it a little bit problematic, you know, that she takes these, uh, these, these data points and just kind of compare them. Um, 
Yeah, but I, I also think because it is so incredibly easy for older people to default into this thinking that if people would just do what we used to do, it wouldn't mm. be so bad. You know, if kids would just be like I was, you know, I scraped up my knees, like I did this, I did that, you know, like <laughs> I, I didn't have it real. You know, when I first started uh, doing generational theories back in <clears throat> early 2000s, I actually worked um, for a CPG company where we were looking at the infant markets. And so my job was to go in on these back then, we didn't have a lot of social media, but we had discussion boards where people were still actually anonymous and people would have discussion and you have these parent boards. So I would be, you know, spending a lot of time on parent boards. And there was so much gripe around like young people, like they had, they didn't have smartphones back then, but you had iPods, you know, they had iPods. They're so spoiled, you know? Uh, and, and I had it hard. I really had to pull myself up by the bootstraps, but look at these kids today. So it's very difficult, I think, for if you have that mindset to, to even think that there could be something else that so could be it, because I, I mentioned digital anthropology, and I actually think that there's a there's a strong um, there, there's you need you actually need this. You need this field to be a bastard. You need it to be an academic bastard because you need to do the very rigorous data science, but you also need the anthropology. So you need sort of like to be able to put yourself into the mindset that perhaps it is so that uh, young people actually perceive the world differently. They perceive the resources differently. Maybe they use social media differently. And that's actually what we see. So, but if you come in with a mindset that, you know, I didn't do this when I was young and I did so much better, then, then I think you're, you're starting in the, you, 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 it's, it's not the way to start. You kind of need to start with talking to these kids. You need to figure out, like, you have to observe them. You have to kind of look at what is it that they actually do with this technology. Wait, you mean treat them like they're human beings and not aliens we have to study from afar? Get out of exactly. here. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, uh, I actually, you know, complaining about the kids is, is a really old pastime. I shared a fun comic in the chat there that I think really shows how this has been going on forever. But, um, and also I just, I wanna add my own little perspective as a millennial who has been on the internet since 1996. So pretty young millennial on the internet. Um, and you know, I'll say, okay, social media didn't exist when I started using the internet in the way we think of it now. But I will first of all point out that like, well, when Facebook came along, it was millennials who joined it first, not Gen Z or other generations. Millennials joined it first. I was in college when it blew up. And I'll point out that there, there was proto-social media before Facebook. There was MySpace, yeah. there was exactly. LiveJournal, there was Zynga, there was Friendster, there was social media. Now yeah. it was it was forum-based asynchronous social media that was not real time and did not have a, a continuously scrolling algorithmically generated feed, but there was social media that you were on chatting with your friends. Yeah, exactly. I think it's very easy to, to forget that, that they, they, they tend to think of social media as like, this is uh, the youngest generation. Actually, what I, when I first became interested in the, in, the, uh, in the connection between young people and social media, my starting point was actually Generation X. Because after a few years, when millennials kind of sort of like, they had already you know, reached the, you know, the, the plateau and, and, and my generation was kind of starting to pick up. And we were the ones at the early 2010s, 2012, we had young kids and we got on social media and I, I remember seeing so much oversharing. Uh, uh, yeah, my, or people my age are older. Maybe, maybe not so much my generation, actually. I don't think experts, but like when I saw like the older generations, like they, they would be oversharing so much. And a lot of the things that they would overshare about was their own kids or their, their grandkids or their nephews or something. And I felt like, ooh, this is TMI. I don't really, you know, if I feel cringy that you share this, I'm sure there's going to come a time when that kid is not going to be very happy to read what you share about them, you know, or see the pictures that you should like. 
So this, and, and now of course we have much more like understanding with consent. You can't just post stuff about people unless you actually ask for their permission. Now well, that- you can, but you might not like what happens. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, uh, so, so I think that that's, that's definitely like that, that shaped that generation. So you, you look at a lot of the behaviors of young people in social media today, and this is, this is kind of stuff that I don't think even passes the radar in a lot of these, these, these um, social media is that cause of mental health problems a lot of times is that uh, young people are using social media with that in mind. They, they're using deletability. I, I mean, that, that's just part of the nature. They, they, they do this purging and where they clean up their feeds and like you men, men, mentioned, Instagram, you know, they have these different personas. So they're able to kind of protect themselves better. They protect their private, privacy better. They protect their, uh, and, and also they have a different comfort level with, with sharing things. So some of them are actually able to be quite vulnerable online, which I think might actually be a, a, good, a good thing because when that becomes normalized, then, then it's not so much about like bottling up your feelings and pretending that you're something that you're not. And, and, and these are the kind of things that I, I think it goes missing. Like it, that's not like how social media is being used and how it's evolving. That doesn't really surface very often in this research. And, um, and, and it's, it'll be interesting, like how that, that narrative is going to continue as we go into the meta metaverse, you know, and like, you know, how is that going to, how is that discussion going to continue to go? Agreed. It's all, it, it's going to be interesting to see how this all evolves. Um, does anybody else have uh, questions for Anne here? or thoughts or things they like to contribute. As I said, you're welcome to chat it. You're welcome to raise your hand or you can unmute and ask. And, and it's fine if you know, uh, you know, if there aren't very many questions, I can probably think up another question or two um, before we adjourn if there's not much questions. All right, let me, uh, let me think what another good thing maybe to ask would be. Um, okay, so your presentation, you get into, um, you know, you talk about that, you know, there's actually a lot of data indicating that for a lot of uh, Gen Z, social media is actually a positive thing for their mental health. But, you know, you do point out that especially in some categories, um, um, you, you point out in some categories that they're, um, it, it, it may very well be detrimental to mental health in, in certain things uh, for certain groups. And I guess I'm wondering, you know, what do you think the things we can do to actually maybe address the places where it does affect mental health intrinsically, the medium, and, and not in these fear-mongering, politicians showboating, grilling Facebook stuff? What, what actually might help these issues, do you think? Oh, so that there's another um, kind of social media conundrum that I'm interested in too, and it's how it's polarizing. And, uh, and, and obviously like polarization is not very good either for mental health, but, and, and, the, and this is another sort of tired trope, I think that, oh, technology is bad because it makes us, uh, it makes us uh, like, uh, it drives us crazy. We become too polarized, right? Um, well, actually the al algorithms are bad, but the mm -hmm. algorithms are not necessarily bad by fundamentally bad. They're bad in the way that they have been optimized. And the reason they're optimized the way they are is because there's someone who actually uh, finds that beneficial. Like, or it, it's, it's, it helps their business model, at least for now. I, I, I think it's interesting to kind of um, imagine what will happen when we're all sort of like drifting apart, like as in, in a universe where we're like just falling into black holes and like, you know, where does that business model eventually end? I don't think it's a good, a sustainable business model. I think that a business model is better when you can draw people together and actually nurture conversations. And so there's there's different ways that I think that, for example, just, just and I, I'm going to get to that about the body issues and stuff in a little bit, but like, 
one of the ways that you can optimize an algorithm, for example, you can maybe use some principles like Grant and Vedder's network theory, which is like basically based on weak links, where you take, for example, instead of optimizing based on how many clicks does this get, let's look at things like how, how, diver how diverse are the viewpoints or the people who have liked this thing over here, how diverse are they? You know, I, are, does this represent many different people with many different types of viewpoints or different types of words mentioned? So it could be optimized for diversity in opinion, for example. Um, the, when you do that, you, you will necessarily, you know, uh, create these community and you could, for example, uh, optimize based on what kind of language people are using that there it's not, you know, offensive. It's not, um, uh, uh, yeah, so basically politeness, you can optimize for politeness. Um, yeah, I think you could do the same thing for body positivity. You can, you can optimize body positive messages better. Um, if, if that is the biggest issue, um, you can um, you can basically use the algorithm against the new algorithms against the old algorithms, if you will. So you can create new communities. And you can create and and you can also have flags. For example, uh, back a few years ago on Tumblr, Tumblr was a was a horrible place because you had like these pro Anna uh, and you know, self-harming and suicidal websites where people would literally try to encourage each other to, to do this. Uh, and so you have these communities, so you can, mod obviously you can moderate it, but I think human moderation, you know, it's it's not possible. So you need to create algorithms to moderate. Right, it, it doesn't scale for billions of people. You can't moderate with humans, billions of people. Exactly, exactly. And, and I think that is also, that's where legislators go wrong. I think legislators go wrong. For example, I think the United Nations lately mentioned, it was some suggestions that nation states, national leaders should ban artificial intelligence if, and there was like some, if it can be misused. And I'm like, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> oh, so, yeah, okay there, I then, so <laughs> ban all of it, okay. Exactly, yeah, and, and I think that there's been like, various legislative efforts to try to suggest that, um, yeah, for example, this idea that, that social media should be regulated like, um, like a newspaper uh, or, or like a regular media source. I, I don't see how that can ever happen because like I said, you can't scale it, it's impossible. And it's it sort of like, it takes away some of the, some of the purpose. But, but I do I do believe that the, the villain here, if there's a villain in those, um, the, those more destructive behaviors and attitudes that we see as a consequence of this, it is precisely because it has been optimized to make us as, as characters uh, of ourselves instead of making us into uh, wholesome human beings, uh, basically. And I think it's possible to use algorithms to do that. Maybe I'm too optimistic, I, but I think so. I, I don't entirely disagree. And I mean, one of the reforms I've always said would actually help that I've pushed for a lot is uh, Facebook, you know, should allow me to, there should be some sort of open API standard where I can swap in any social media algorithm feed I want that anyone anywhere on the internet made. And I can run my Facebook feed with that algorithm. I think that alone would be one of the biggest things that would fix the problem. So it, it squares quite a lot of your thoughts with what I've been thinking. And, and I just also want to emphasize like, yeah, I, I abs once again, what everybody blaming polarization purely on the technology. I, I one time was in some thread with somebody who I was beating that drum and I just basically kind of threw up my hands and was like, well, you know, one, I've actually had some of the most enlightening discussions period on social media I've ever had, like more area that I learned more than in college, you know? And on the other hand, like, have you never seen a bar fight? Like, you don't need <laughs> social media for people to start being assholes. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. It's, um, yeah, no, I, I, I totally share that sentiment. I think my own social media uh, networks, I used to keep them fairly small, but they've grown quite big, at least in my standard, because I think, I think humans can only have, 
I think we can only have a hundred friends or something. I don't think it's, there was some research. The, 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 the number is, Dunbar's number is posited to be about 150 people. Yes, that, that Dunbar's you, that, number. That you can know more than 150 people, exactly. but you can only have a meaningful friendship with 150 at any one time. Exactly. And, and for me, the fact that my social networks have expanded way beyond the Dunbar maximum number, that forces me to kind of, it forces me to interact with people who are very different from me and to read what they think and how do they think about things. And, and it's actually useful for me because I grow, I feel like I grow that way. And it's, it's making me a less biased person, I would think. Or but then minimum, again, it forces you to have, even if it doesn't change your opinion, it forces you to have stronger arguments for your opinion because you encounter the smart arguments against your opinion. Exactly. Exactly. I think that's true. But that I'm also like another thing that I think that people should realize that they can do. And this is something that Generation Z is very good at. Like, um, so Generation Z will talk about algorithms as their personal possessions. So yeah, they will talk about my algorithm. So they're very common for Gen Zers to just like talk about this is my algorithm. What that means is that this is something they train. They train their algorithm like a dog. So they train it in order because they know how it works. So they- they They're very they aware it. that they watch certain kinds of videos. They'll see more of that kind of video. And so yeah. they, they very actively sculpt their algorithm, their feed to reflect who they are. Exactly, they do. And I, I, I'm taking some cues from that myself. Like I, I I personally, I try to avoid like very contentious like debates. I, I, I might read them, but I, I try not to respond to it because it just like, I, I don't feel anything good comes out of that. And, and I love animal videos. So like, I, I tend to really dig animal videos and I click, you know, people say, oh, when they, remember when they talked about like internet was gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna degenerate because of cat videos. And then now it's like the best thing we can do for ourselves and our mental health is to dig cat videos, you know, because everything else is shit. <laughs> there, there, it probably couldn't hurt for us to have more of the cat videos again. I do have one question for you that I was asked to forward, which is, I don't know if your research or the research has been done. Has, have you looked at all into like, you know, there's the sort of zone of people who are right on the millennial Gen Z divide, zennials as they're sometimes called, are there like, are, they, are there noticeable differences in there? attitudes on everything we've been talking about on their mental health on their use of social media do we see a blend of millennials and gen z are they all gen z are they all millennial just like what how do somebody who i suspect is a zennial is asking how do zennials fit into this conversation well as i'm just gonna as someone that thinks like i i am technically a millennial but i have a lot more ideological and I would go so far as to say practical overlap with Gen Z because a lot of what you described of Gen Z's perspective has been my perspective so I'm really curious as to hear what you have to say to you sorry for interrupting so yes uh there's a lot of commonality between those two, two generations and again let remember what I said about like most generational um Oh, and actually, sorry, I, I did mix it up a bit where I forgot. Zennial is the blend of millennial and Gen X. So maybe we can expand the question to say just where, maybe we can just expand this to different generational attitudes, period. But, but, but do the Gen Z millennial one first. I just, I realized I misrepresented the original question. Oh yeah, no problem. Um, but yeah, so um the, the, again, you know, most most sort of perceptions that we have huge, profound differences between generations, most of that can be debunked. Um, and we actually don't have enough longitudinal, enough longitudinal data to say a whole lot of difference between millennials and, and generation Zers. One of the things, though, that I've noticed with generation Z is that um, a lot of things reaches the peak with millennials. A lot of things do. So, uh, for example, this about, you know, mood, I, I mentioned this about narcissism, like that, it, that goes back down again with the younger generations. Um, and, and also about like mood, like millennials tend to be, they're still pretty, I think that they had a 
they've been in for some pretty rocky rides lately. So I would, you know, student debt and a lot of things, but they're still fairly optimistic. A lot of, I, I can't really remember exactly now, but a lot of time, I spend a lot of times looking at surveys, obviously. And I, I look at like, how do different generations respond to different things? And millennials, like it, it reaches the peak with millennials and then it goes down. It's almost like we've reached a pendulum where it's now coming back again with Gen Zers in many respects. Um, but, but definitely uh, Gen uh, Z, Definitely, that is a very a men mental health for Gen Z. That's a very clear generational trend. Um, not that millennials have not also experienced, but it's, it's also a period effect. So like, I think every generation has, most generations, including boomers, have had, had a worsening of mental health issues, which could have something to do with these, these problems that we have already discussed. But you see it profoundly profoundly for Generation Z. So it's like much, much stronger. Um, but also when it comes to things like uh, the, how enamored um, different generations is, uh, are with like the latest, the newest and the greatest, actually this younger generation, they are truly digital natives. And what I mean by that, it's not someone who is like all gung ho or the newest thing came up, NFTs, metaverse. No, 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 no. It's not about that at all. It's quite the opposite. It's like, if you're native to something, it means that you see the good and the bad. It's like, I'm native to Norway. I've seen, you know, I've seen Norway on a really sluggish day when it's cold and dark. So it means that I, I know in Norway can be beautiful, but I don't see it like a tourist. So it's the same thing. And young people had their, their embarrassing child photos posted on their mom's Facebook wall. They can definitely see the, 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 you know, the bad stuff. So like, I, I don't even think that we give them enough you know, uh, credit for all of this. Um, so, so, so that's interesting. Like there's a lot of trends where it's kind of like coming back again with Generation Z. I don't know if that was a, actually an answer. Well, I, I do find that interesting. And I mean, it does square a bit with my own self-perception maybe as a millennial. Um, you know, I don't know if I'd use a word as, as harsh as narcissism to describe myself, but when I'm being brutally honest, I, I you know, I, I can often have a bit of an inflated uh, opinion of my opinion about things, shall we say. But particularly the part I thought you that seems to square with myself and the millennials I know versus the people who are more Gen Z I know, which is, I think you are right that maybe optimism is a weird sort of difference between the two generations, because you are correct. Millennials have been through a lot of really rough, horrific experiences as well, although they happened right as we were coming into college instead of when we were young. Well, I guess if you count 9-11 as the start when we were teenagers instead of when we were barely born, but yeah, but Millennials, and I include myself in this, we tend to still be weirdly optimistic about the future, despite maybe the evidence not warranting that optimism, yeah. while Gen Z is like, no, it, it's not happening. So I think yeah. we may be on to something there. It at least matches my own self, my own yeah. experiences and perception. Yes, that could possibly, that's a good, that's a good explanation. And I think also that there's something in, um, there's power in numbers, right? And millennials, they are a very big generation. Um, what has happened with Generation Z, like uh, during their generation, there's, there's, there was a decline in the birth rate and also the immigration rate so that we're, we're way under replacement level. Which really means that, um, and actually, when you ask young young people, they they don't want to have kids. They really don't. And I mean, I think most young people say, "I don't want to have kids," but then they grow into. But in this case, it's like it's based on like a really fundamental uh, pessimism of the future. They don't want to bring kids into this world. So so it's kind of like, you know you see it on so many levels and and then of course when there's fewer of you there's there are fewer to represent you and um millennials could like really become like a very engaged political generation that is going to you know be like the next boomers that have a lot of political power and influence and um gen zers might might feel that they don't 
they feel a little bit overwhelmed. You know, I, I'm an exer. There's a lot of very noisy boomers above me. And we were kind of neglected, you know, and I, I think that Gen Zers are kind of seeing the same thing, like they're, they're becoming a more neglected generation. Do we got any uh, other questions for Anne? It is fine if we don't. There is no rule. We have to use up our whole allotted two hours. If the conversation has run its course, it's run its course. But uh, we'll make sure, see, just want to see if we have any final questions for Anne before we maybe segue to the end here. I don't have any questions, but Anne, I want you to know that you got some really good Twitter quotes that I'm that that I that are great, and I tagged you in them. I hope they don't spark any debates between you and random people on Twitter. If they do, I will happily come to your defense as my own person. But just letting you know. <laughs> you know, I I welcome that. Actually, I um I do actually like uh, conversations in social media. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, bring it on. I mean, I even like really contentious ones as long as everyone is like respectful, you know, which I know it seems like such a low bar to clear, and yet people fail it all the time. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I have a question, David. What is there a particular, well, is there a particular hashtag for the Twitter thread or should they just go look at our Twitter? You can go look at our Twitter page. Um, I didn't create like an EFF awesome monthly meetup hashtag. I probably should have, um, but some of the consistent hashtags that I did use were social media, mental health, and Gen Z. Um, so those should lead you to the convert to the to the quoting session as well. And if and yeah, this is the first time we've well we may have done long ago, maybe even predating my tenure with EFF Austin way back in your, we, we may have done some live tweeting with Twitter, but it's not been a regular thing we've done for years. So this basically is an experiment. If there's any part of it that worked for you or didn't work for you, let me or David know and we can uh, tweak the process. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I, yeah, I am. Um, when we're finished up tonight, I will definitely check out the Twitter feed. I, it looks, I like Twitter. I, one of the things that I'm noticing in my own life is that I just don't have time for social media. It used to be like, um, you would go on social media because you we were a little bored. And now I feel like, ah, oh, I'm supposed to like, I'm supposed to be relevant. I'm supposed to share something. And I just don't have the time. And like, so I, I absolutely love it when people do it for me <laughs> because it's, it's nice to keep like, you know, it's nice to keep that conversation going. And it, it just, it takes time and effort. And I, that's what I'm finding myself like, lacking quite a bit these days yeah we got a comment here saying you know they they love twitter and hate facebook you know and i mean i know there are people who really have that sentiment like i know uh cory doctor who's probably a smarter man than me like got rid of facebook like a decade ago but he's still quite active on twitter and i mean i i will say um you know, at least traditionally, I've mainly used social media to chat with my friends, which is why maybe I've been on Facebook more than Twitter, though, you know, as I do more and more EFF awesome -y stuff, Twitter maybe makes more sense for me, though Facebook's groups have been useful as well. But one thing I have always appreciated about Twitter compared to Facebook is, you know, Twitter is quite open that this is all completely public. It's not like Facebook that like, sort of pretends it's private, but it's really not. You know, Twitter is quite open about what it is. There isn't really duplicity there. Mm -hmm. I see, yeah. Yeah, but, I... Oh, Garo has a question or a comment. <laughs> I had to unmute myself. Yeah, a question for Anne. Since uh, I don't know the the last time you, you lived in Europe, uh, but I, I lived there like, in the, the late 80s. Mm -hmm. And it was strange coming back, coming back home to the United States. I would tell my friends, you know, about things in Europe. And, you know, the trains, the buses, better transportation system, uh, better education. And they would just either say, oh, if you don't like America, leave. Or how come you didn't stay there? Or, you know, that's, we do things our way and they do things their way. So, you know, you're showing me this, this data uh, uh, about the youth in the United States and you're comparing it, you know, to, you know, to other places. Uh, 
Mm. So it would seem that obviously these people that are doing the research that they just wouldn't look at trends in the United States. Maybe they would look at trends in England and Europe and other places where they also use social media and they would, they would, they would realize, oh, I'm, I'm making a false, you know, cause that, what was the word? Correlation, causation. Well, yeah, false cause out. Ca- cause out. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, how, I mean, you would think these people would be smart enough to like, to do that. So what, what is the bias that is keeping them from looking, you know, across the ocean or, you know. That's, you know, that's a really good question. I'm so glad you asked uh, ask that because actually lately I did notice that uh, Twingy and Heights, they had done uh they, they had looked at some, some international numbers. So, uh, and I was, yay, finally, you know, I was so glad to see that. Um, where they looked at, um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm just gonna plug in my computer. Um, uh, where the, So PISA, which is it called PISA, that, uh, you know, the organization that looks at um, academic scores, they have now started to also ask children questions about things like if they're feeling lonely and you know loneliness is something that has been um, thought of as a in connection with social media that's actually I feel like that is a little bit better argument to make possibly even you know it's a little bit easier to see the connection between loneliness and and, and social media but anyway so they, they got all of this data and so they got international data and then they uh, looked at okay uh, loneliness has increased and then um, and social media has increased in those countries as well. So they did that. Okay, good. All right. And then they said, okay, we should probably try to control for some other variables. So they took, but then they took like, so they, they wanted to see, are there, does, does it co-vary with some other things? And then they looked at things like GDP and fertility rates. So it was like, huh? And then they said, well, fertility rates did not increase and neither did GDP. And the only thing that the only correlation we found was between loneliness and, and social media use. So therefore, this is happening internationally as well. And I'm like, I, I felt that. No, no, there's got to be. I So at least they have tried, but I don't think they succeeded. Like, I don't think they succeeded. But they, I, again, you know, that sounds incredibly cocky of me because these guys are way smarter than I am. And they, they, there might be something a nuance that I misunderstand. So if I misunderstood their, 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 their scope and the research, then um, mea culpa, uh, and I will say, I will eat that. But based on what I read, um, it didn't seem like it. And I, I really, really think that on a lot of social issues, if we took the time to look at data from other countries and we did those comparisons, we would be able to check these theories much better. And it isn't happening nearly enough. The one thing that, and it's interesting too, that, that global perspective, because mental health is a fairly global phenomenon. It is, um, there's, it, it, there's been a lot of research. And, but again, like when they ask the kids, when they ask the kids themselves, why are you, what are you worried about? Especially anxiety. And what are they anxious about? And, and it's, it's never social media. It's, Usually it's kind of tied up to climate change, actually. They're very worried about climate change. And especially in countries that are going to be more affected with it. So, you know. Yep, um, and, I, and I'll just also say that, you know, uh, you know, there's actually reasonable reason to believe, you know, even when dealing with, you know, clearly very smart uh, researchers who take their work seriously and are trying to posit real results that, you know, one should always be willing to question if one thinks one spotted a flaw in their methodologies or data, because I mean, um, this may be fairly known to some of the people in this in this chat, but um, but there is an ongoing debate in, in, in the sciences right now that's essentially called the uh, replication crisis. And it is the acknowledged fact among scientists that actually the majority of published scientific results and papers are wrong, or in the sense that nobody can reproduce the results of the paper actually. So it, it happens a lot. <laughs> and it's actually, a, it's a huge problem in the sciences right now. The scientists are legitimately trying to figure out how to address it. So, you know, 
and so yes, you know, they, they may be acting in good faith and they may be smart and they may be doing good research, but there, there may be very much flaws in some of the conclusions, you know, and why we, you know, it's always good when somebody else comes in to test the paper and potentially even better when it's somebody whose financial livelihood isn't on the line because the reason nobody tests anybody else's papers is it isn't tied to funding. So scientists want to publish new results, not test existing ones. Exactly. I think I think that has a lot to do with it. And I think that once you have published something that proves a possible connection, you kind of have to continue to ride that horse. Because if you all of a sudden, oh, yeah, no, I found this last year, but then now I'm finding a way to actually uh, refute myself, then then you won't get funding and you won't get to hold talks. You can't write books anymore. There's a lot of things that there's a lot of sort of uh, vested interest in continuing to ride the horse that you first started riding at the beginning, you know? <clears throat> so, yeah, I, um, I, I, I really hope, I really hope that we, what we get also, like as we're speaking of a new generation, that we actually get a new generation of scientists that comes in and rebel, like, you know, just really change the whole, you know, how that is the whole the whole um the, the funding structure and um what is considered good research good research and and um for example one of the things that and, and honestly this is one of the reasons that i sort of i'm not doing generational research more than part-time is because very often i was called to can you can you take this project over here for this company can you can you hold this presentation? We really want you to talk about this connection. And I was like, uh, well, well, that connection is kind of not really a connection. I can, I can problematize and I can tell you guys like why, why this is a perception of a clear in the connection. But actually, if you look over here, kind of like what I did today, it doesn't sell at all. Like they're not interested in that. Because if someone has decided that like, I want to hear about this, then you're not going to be able to come in and change that that cognitive bias, if you want to call it that. And if, if, if that's an organization that has decided that this is what we believe, you can't come in and shift, you can't come in and change that. And, and that's really the opposite of science. So I, you can't do good science if you, if you are driven by a, your own or other people's cognitive biases. Indeed. Yeah. Do we have any uh, final questions for Anne? Cool. All right. Well, I think I will call it here. So um, I want to thank uh, Anne uh, for speaking on a, uh, I thought it was a very interesting talk. Uh, I had a lot of interesting things to chew on and I hope you all did as well. And um, finally, um, just want to let y'all know that we usually, um, after our virtual meetups, we do a little bit of a virtual hangout uh, that our friend Mike Furstenfeld of Make Every Media allows us to do with his Gather Town room, which I'm actually going to allow him to explain it. He, I'm also going to let him give you a little preview of, since he's going to be our speaker next month, I'm going to let him give you a little preview of what he's going to be talking about, as well as introduce our uh, sort of virtual happy hour after this. So I'm going to let him be able to unmute himself there, and he can take it away. <clears throat> hello, hello. Testing, testing. <laughs> can you see me? I'm on my cell phone. Yep. I'm also on a computer in the gather town. And <laughs> if you go to make every media.com slash media lounge, you can get your day pass link. Uh, gather is kind of a metaverse. I mean, it's not related to meta. <laughs> uh, it's a separate company from Facebook. It's gather. They haven't been bought by Facebook yet. Um, but it's kind of a 2d metaverse that it doesn't require a VR headset. It's just a web browser. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work great on mobile devices yet, phones yet, uh, but it's, it's still kind of a cool new technology. It makes use of uh, spatial video conferencing so you can move your little avatar. You can create a little avatar and move them around the screen using the keyboard arrows. And as you get closer to other people's avatars, their videos and audios start to fade in. And you, you can leave conversations if you don't want to be part of that conversation. You can explore 
uh, the whole space. There's lots of Easter eggs and whiteboards to draw on and games to play. Uh, and then you can also go to directly to the stage to the left. That's usually where the EFF folks congregate uh, uh, so, that, so that they can be heard by everyone in the room. Uh, <laughs> if, you, if you jump on the stage all the way to the left of the room, uh, then you will be heard by everyone in the room. There's a lot of other features we can go over. If you get in there, we can watch videos together. Uh, it's pretty cool though. It's, it's kind of, it's the closest thing that we found yet to being with each other in what feels like a physical space without a VR headset. And it is one of the many technologies I will be covering in my January talk, how to make every media with free and open source software where I will be putting together a resource sheet basically and presenting on how to get started in any media of your choosing, whether it be podcast, film, uh, virtual conferences, app development, uh, trying to just centralize for myself, partially <laughs> knowledge about the best open source uh, software technologies for, for several different media, uh, including game development uh, and uh, and I think we'll be even diving into a little bit of, of unity um, towards the end of the talk to talk about how uh, we might make an EFF Austin video game uh, quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just a preview of my talk. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Kevin, for letting me speak. I hope to see some of you in the media lounge. Awesome. Well, uh, so yes, so there's an open invitation. Any of you who are free to, uh, to join us. Um, we'll hang around for at least a little bit, me and Mike, um, to see if anybody pops in. Um, but yeah, and as I said, stay tuned. We're, we're tentatively going to try to revisit in-person meetups next month. Obviously, me and Mike will be talking about the logistics of that, as well as making sure that there are still options for those who wish to attend virtually. Um, including potentially the speaker. I've not had these conversations with Mike yet, but we, we could even potentially trial a remote speaker since I do know I have speakers net for next year who are remote, but we'll do whatever is Mike's preference. But yes, yeah, stay tuned. Um, I'm very rusty about in-person meetups at this point. So <laughs> there, you will have to bear with me if it is a rusty first one. I am uh, very out of practice on doing these things in person. But anyway, uh, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Anne, for speaking. It was great. Uh, we'll have to keep having you back because we all keep learning a lot. Um, and also, thank you so much, uh, uh, as uh, you as well as uh, Carl, for yesterday uh, taking part in the, uh, the privacy panel. I really appreciated the perspective both of you brought to that. I thought we had a very, very good discussion. So anyway, thank you all for attending. Um, as I said, this the next one of these will be the second uh, Tuesday of January at 7 p.m. Follow us uh, on social media to keep up with things. And actually also stay tuned. We are in the process of an EFF Austin website redesign. And we're sort of tentatively hoping we might be able to launch version one of it early in the new year. So uh, stay tuned for that as well. But anyway, thank you all. And we'll, uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much, Kevin.